On today's two on your side town hall, treating pets more like our children. I know a lot of you already do that, but I'm talking about in the eyes of the law. You won't want to miss that story coming up in just a moment. Plus, you have asked us about mask rules for kids at summer camps. An update on the CDC's guidance after some initial confusion about that. And a blood emergency. If you've ever thought about donating but never got around to it, we're going to explain why now really is a great time. Thank you for being with us tonight here on the town hall. We want to talk about two things that might not seem to go together at first. Dogs and divorce. I suppose it depends, Michael, what you mean by dogs. That's a great point. Stay with us here. We'll explain it. The New York State Senate passed four animal related bills today. One of them bans the retail sale of pets in pet stores with the goal of ending puppy mills. Another makes it easier to charge someone with aggravated cruelty to animals and one requires landlords to look for animals at abandoned properties. But it's the fourth bill that really caught our eye. This deals with pets and divorce proceedings. It's sponsored by downstate Democrat James Scoofus. His bill passed 60 to 0 today and says instead of treating pets like property when things get divided up, the judge should consider what is in the best interest of the animals, similar to children. And Senator Scoofus joins us live right now to answer some of the questions about this bill. Senator, thanks for joining us to talk about this tonight. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let's start with um, the synopsis that we just gave. Make sure we didn't get anything wrong there. And then can you explain the impetus for this bill for us? I mean, most people consider their pets to be part of the family like their kids. There's so much of a bond. Um, we can see how it will be easy for both parents to get an attachment. And then when a divorce happens, obviously that can really complicate things. What should we know about how this would change the law? That's exactly right. And it's actually two thirds of households have a dog or a cat in them in New York and across the country. And 40% of uh, couples, sadly, married couples do get divorced. And so, you know, this isn't some like rare occurrence where we have to deal with what do we do with our favorite cat or favorite dog. It happens with some frequency, unfortunately. And the impetus is this look, I, I feel that, you know, your beloved. Uh, animal ought to be treated in court with a bit more compassion and what to do with that animal than say your Honda Civic. Uh, you know, the, the, your dog, your cat should not be treated as an asset. It should be treated as a member of the family and its interests, which parents, let's put it that way, uh, should the cat or dog go to uh, as the divorce proceeds? And so that's where the bill comes from. I look to treat our uh, our loved ones uh, with some compassion if uh, if the mother and father of that pet do get divorced. I'm curious how this is being treated now. And also, New York isn't the first to look at doing this, correct? And, and how has it been handled elsewhere? Yeah, th that's right. So we're not the first state to do this, and we're not reinventing the wheel. But the matter of fact is here in New York State, pets are treated just like assets, uh, such as furniture and cars, like I mentioned before. And that's not taking the best interests of the, the pet uh, in mind. You know, where are each of uh, the, the uh, parents going to be living after the divorce, for example? And what household is more appropriate and more comfortable for that pet? Uh, who spends more time with the pet? These are all things that ought to be considered. Uh, just similar to how a child uh, is treated in, in divorce court, by the way. Uh, you don't just treat a child as though, you know, who owns that child or, you know, treat that child as an asset. You treat where that child goes uh, as if, you know, it's in the best interest of that child to go to X or to Y uh, after uh, parents get divorced. And so that's what we're looking to do with pets here. Yeah, I know a lot of people watching right now would be quite offended by the idea of treating a pet like an asset and not as a as an actual living thing. Um, this same bill passed the Senate a few years back. Um, it did not get a vote in the assembly back then. When we look at today's tally, uh, it's not easy to get a unanimous vote for anything these days with politics uh, kind of the way it is. With that kind of overwhelming support, do you think that this can pass in the assembly this go around? And then, of course, you would need the governor to sign it. That's that's right. There there are few things these days that bring Democrats and Republicans together. But I'm glad to see at least our furry loved ones uh, is one of those last remaining uh, policy points that can bring us together. I do believe this is going to pass the assembly. The bill is uh, moving in the assembly through the committee process. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, for the first time it's going to get to the governor's desk and we'll see this made into law. 
Senator Skoufis, I want to ask you because, you know, when we ask our viewers questions, a lot of the times, you know, they don't answer a lot. If we ask them to send pictures of their dogs, we get a ton of pictures. All of that said, they love their pets, but they'll also say, don't they have anything more important to focus on in Albany right now? Um, what is your response to people who may consider this to be a bit trivial? So, so I, I think anyone that has a pet would argue that a, this is certainly not trivial, but even if you feel that uh, this isn't the most important thing in the world right now, uh, we can walk and chew gum at the same time in the state legislature. Uh, we literally pass thousands of bills every year, we just enacted a 200 or so billion dollar budget a month ago. And so this is not taking the place of you know anything that uh, people may view as more important. This is in addition to any other items uh, that uh, you may feel are important. And so, you know, but like I said, two thirds of households, they have a pet and they can sympathize, I'm sure, with making sure that their, their loved one is taken care of uh, in the event that there is a divorce. Senator James Skoufis has been our guest this evening. He represents New York's 39th State Senate District, which is just south of Poughkeepsie. Also a brand new dad. Congratulations on that. I know your schedule is hectic and you guys are also in session in Albany right now. So thanks for taking some time and coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again. Take care. Thanks for being here. We're going to move on now to talk about the pandemic and with fewer COVID cases and more vaccinations, everyone is wondering, hey, when is it going to end? Yeah, of course, that is impossible to know at this exact moment, right? But the CDC does have some new modeling, just as the White House has put out new goals in terms of getting shots into arms this summer. And we got a nice recap with the latest on all of this from Dr. John Torres, medical correspondent with NBC News. This week, President Biden announced a goal of having at least one dose of the COVID vaccine in the arms of 70% of the adult population by this July 4th. Currently, 56% of the adult population has gotten at least one dose of the vaccine, so we do still have a ways to go. Now, we know the vaccines are proven safe and effective, and anyone 16 or older is now eligible to get one. And NBC News also expects the FDA to authorize the Pfizer COVID vaccine for children 12 to 15 years old as early as next week. Plus, more good news. The CDC has released new modeling projections that suggest we could be done with the worst of this pandemic by July, but only if we continue vaccinations while masking and social distancing when needed. The light is at the end of the tunnel. We just all need to help out to make that light even brighter. Yeah, and it's great to hear Dr. Torres say that. Uh, a couple of footnotes to that, though. We're going to talk more later on in the show about these 12 to 15 year olds and the possibility that the Pfizer vaccine may be available to them um, as early as, as later this month. I mean, this could happen pretty quickly. But beyond that, the time frame, Kate, we've talked forever about when do we hit herd immunity, right? And if by July, if things are going well and that can happen, what a difference. Well, and once again, it is a team effort as it has been from the beginning, but it does seem at least after there not being very much movement for so long that things are starting to pick up a little bit at least. Yeah, fingers crossed it continues. Also, this news out today from the Biden administration that could help poorer countries get more people vaccinated, Kate. The U.S. Trade Representative said today that the administration backs waiving patient protections for COVID, patent protections rather, for COVID vaccines and will help negotiate that at the World Trade Organization, though that could take time because this is really complex. Yeah, a waiver like that would get rid of obstacles for developing countries to make their own vaccines. So think of places like India, where they're reporting more than 400,000 new cases a day right now. It's just hard to imagine. In fact, the Biden administration also announced last week that it's going to start shipping the raw materials to India so that they can start doing some of that vaccine production. I mean, we see the images and hear the stories out of India right now, and it's just horrific. And, and they are not able to keep up in terms of vaccinations so that they can kind of make a dent in the community spread that's happening. Right. It's stunning there. And also something that I've heard recently is, is the idea that social distancing in India is something considered a luxury um, so that it really is a dire situation. Yeah. And India is just one country. I mean, there are developing countries all over the world that just at this point do not have access to vaccines. So this is a big development, something we'll continue to follow closely, but it's a global game, right? We don't just have to vaccinate Americans. We have to vaccinate the world, yeah. and uh, we'll see how this plays into that. More to come on that.